Hello everyone, welcome to our Saturday broadcast. Everyone, welcome. We missed last week due to technical difficulties, but we're back as usual. So we'll start with a short meditation. Just get yourself in a position. You're sitting comfortably, alert. And focus all your attention on the practice. You can shut down anything else you might be doing. Okay, so the basic focus of our practice is to try and cultivate what we call mindfulness or sati. Sati means to remember, so remembering what's happening, not forgetting what's happening, not losing track of the present moment. And we do this by reminding ourselves. So this is a way of describing how a mantra works. A mantra focuses your attention on the object, reminds you of the object. So the first mantra we use, we focus on our stomach. When the breath comes into the body, stomach rises. When the breath goes out, falling. So our mantra to start is just rising, falling, just feeling the movement of the stomach, expanding and contracting. If you can't feel it at first, you can just put your hand on your stomach. That can help in the beginning. And you're not trying to control the breath or change it in any way. Just try to experience it as it happens, when it happens. The idea is to create mindfulness, right? To be present with the experience, whatever the experience might be. As you're focused on the stomach, you most likely find other experiences distracting you from the rising and the falling. And that's okay because we're not really concerned with one experience or another, just concerned with the quality of our mind as we experience. So whatever other experiences arise, we try to take them as an object and just make sure we're Sticking with the experience and not getting lost in our reactions or judgments to the of the experience. So for example, if there's any feeling of pain or pleasure or calm, the Buddha said to be mindful of the 
pain or the pleasure and the calm. Take it as your object, feelings. Just say to yourself, pain, 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 and just stay with it for as long as it lasts. Once it's gone, you can just go back to the stomach and continue with rising, falling, just to keep yourself connected to the present moment. Another distraction might be thoughts, thoughts about the past or future, good thoughts, bad thoughts. We're not trying to stop ourselves from thinking again, just try and make yourself conscious of the seeing as seeing, of the thinking as thinking. And say to yourself, thinking, thinking. And the activity of mindfulness strengthens the mind, keeps you focused on the experience without reaction. But in the beginning especially, you still find that you'll be unmindful from time to time and you will react to things. Now, that's not such a problem until you start reacting to your reactions. So even our reactions, our judgments, our emotions, we want to be mindful of. And the Buddha laid out five states of mind that you should also, just general categories of mind states that you should also be alert to and not react to them either. Liking, disliking. These are on the two sides. Uh, drowsiness and distraction. They're opposites as well. And doubt as the fifth. So liking and disliking, disliking covers any kind of aversion, sadness, fear, frustration, boredom. 
depression. Liking covers wanting and craving and desire, lust. So just try and note these. You say to yourself, liking or wanting, wanting or disliking, frustration, bored, bored, sad, sad. Just try and note it until it goes away and then go back to the rising and falling. So you can cut off the reaction, the chain reaction, where you react to your emotions and become more caught up in them. you feel tired or if you feel restless, this means not enough energy or too much energy, just try and balance your concentration and energy and just say to yourself, drowsy or tired, tired or restless or worried or distracted. And if you have any doubt, try to just cut it off by a mind that is certain. Say to yourself, doubting, doubting. And then you'll be in a state of not doubting because you're certain that it's doubt. And it helps change the habit of doubting to one that is collected and strong and certain, sure of itself. And finally, you can be aware of the experiences at the six senses. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and well, thinking we already talked about, but the other five. This is where our reactions arise. This is where all of our experiences occur. So it's a good framework to remember. If you see anything, even with your eyes closed, say to yourself, seeing, seeing. If you hear a sound hearing, you smell a good smell or bad smell, say smelling, smelling. If you taste something sweet, sour, or salty, whatever taste, just say tasting, tasting. If you feel something on the body, feeling. And after a while, if it doesn't go away, just go back to the rising, falling.
All right, so that's our guided meditation. And we'll move on to questions and answers. From now on, everything in the chat should be only questions. Thank you, Bhante. We do have questions. In terms of some kind of goal or momentum, how often should I be noting outside of sitting or walking? Should it really be moment to moment throughout the day? I struggle hard with this. Well, okay, I don't know exactly how you're struggling, um, but it's probably unlikely that you are able to practice moment to moment during your entire waking hours. So I guess it really depends what you mean by struggle. Like if you're struggling to do that, I guess I would stop struggling. Don't, don't have high, such high expectations for yourself because you'll just be disappointed uh, unless you're an enlightened being. Um, if you struggle with the idea of it, like whether it's actually beneficial or, or, or useful, then you should note that sense of struggling or worrying or, or, or doubting about it, because that's just experiences as well. But, um, you know, as far as whether you should be, I mean, as much as you can, it's a great, it, it's a great tool to help build the habit of, of mindfulness, which allows you to see clearly if you're not doing it regularly then you you're you're going to have a very slow progress because you won't be able to build the habit when i watch certain actors on tv my head pings like a pinball machine i've noticed it's only certain actors this happens with any idea should i say pinging I don't know what you mean. My head pings like it twitches. I would note feeling if you're if it's happening slowly. If it's happening very quickly and it's already over, you can well you can still note feeling or you can also note knowing, just the awareness that something happened, just note that awareness. If someone wants to learn this meditation technique, how important is their religious background? if they believe in God. Uh, well, it, uh, I guess it, it's a, you have to clarify what you mean by how important is it. So are you asking whether we will accept them? Probably not. That's not what you're probably asking more like, how will how will their religious background affect the results of the practice or their benefit of the practice? So it, it's a little more about whether the two are compatible, because ultimately they're not. Belief in God is not really compatible with the practice, but it doesn't mean that there's any problem with someone who believes in God coming to practice. It just means that there's going to be limits on how far they can go. Um, without giving up God. So it's much more, I would say, about uh, whether how important that belief is to, is to them and how, how attached they are to that belief. Because a lot of people believe in God, but would be able to put it aside for the meditation practice and gain great results. But if the view is very important, it's going to start to conflict. And there's going to be... It's harder to gain the capacity to, to put out effort um, or it's going to be hard to, harder to believe in God. So you'll find your belief in God kind of waning, and that can scare people into stopping practicing and that sort of thing. I wouldn't say it's a big deal. I, I, honestly, if it's, if it's not you we're talking about, if it's someone else, I would just not worry about it. Any, anyone can come and practice. It's not something we usually talk about. We certainly don't say you're wrong. Your belief in God is wrong, and you have to let it go or leave it at the door or something. But practically speaking, it's going to eventually conflict. It's just, I wouldn't worry too much about it generally. It's not something you really have to talk about until someone gets 
deep into the practice and starts to see the the contradictions. But I think often people just give up the belief in God, or at least temper it, temper it with um, the, the the more important realizations about experience, because they're not directly connected. Um, you know, not it, it. You can you can on a higher level, like sort of cerebrally believe in God where uh, your actual experience has nothing to do with God, right? The meditation doesn't even involve, there's no point where it says, beyond this point, drop your belief in God. No, it's you're, you're just experiencing experiences, reality. If we note whatever arises, but also can't possibly note everything, how can we ever gain requisite concentration for mindfulness? Letting some stuff pass without noting feels arbitrary. Is that okay? It's not really requisite concentration for mindfulness. Mindfulness is it's much more like mindfulness evokes concentration. Um, but, I mean, that doesn't, I guess, quite answer your question. So, noting is, is about evoking mind states, mindfulness, evoking mindfulness. And by doing that, you build a habit, you cultivate a habit of it, and that habit starts to take over, or maybe not take over, but it, it um, reinforces the practice, makes it easier, makes it more fluid. Um, and, and so it works more in a feedback loop, that the more you do it, the, the better you get at it, and the easier it becomes to do it and your mind becomes more in tune with mindfulness anyway. So, I don't know, I mean, your, your question is a little bit cerebral or intellectual, and I don't think it's something you have to worry about. Uh, if, if you're finding trouble in your practice, we can talk about that, but if you're just doubting the practice, I would say it's not really a, 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 a proper formulation of, of a, a problem. Like, there's not really an issue with what you're saying. So I would recommend checking it out, trying it out, and see what happens. I can't calm my mind with a 15-minute meditation after a stressful day at work. How long do you recommend for meditation after work? Well, I'd, I'd like to first address the statement that um, if you know anything about our practice, we're not concerned with feeling calm. And if you're trying to calm your mind, which it sounds like you are, then you're not practicing according to the teachings this, this of this tradition. So I would recommend that you try and read our booklet and, and uh, maybe do an at-home course to get a sense of how we practice or how mindfulness is practiced, because mindfulness is not about uh, calming the mind. It's about seeing clearly and, and realizing that your mind isn't always going to be calm. Because the real problem is not that you're not calm, it's that you react to that reality. So, was, for example, if your mind is active, that's not a problem. It's just thoughts. But the problem is that you're always reacting to them. We're constantly reacting to our thoughts. And that's where this changes. Mindfulness helps you not react to it. As for how long I recommend... Uh, you know, there, there's no set number. I mean, recommend uh, quitting your job, becoming a monk, and meditating all day. I mean, it, 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 there's no limit. Um, but realistically, you have to figure that out for yourself. I do recommend doing some walking and some sitting. I recommend doing some in the morning and some in the evening if you can, if you really want to have a good, solid practice. You know, if you say you're going to do some in the morning and some in the evening, even if you miss one or another, it's still, you know, you're still doing some a day, some every day. And when you can do twice a day, then you'll find it really uh, positively affects your life. How do we know if our positive results from this technique are a result of temporary concentration we've built or are from actually seeing clearly. Hmm. Um. I guess I I I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't be so concerned. Put it this. Consider it this way. What is the quality of mind that arises when you're mindful? 
and get a sense of the qual that quality of mind. Is it a good quality or a bad quality? No, is it is is the change meaningless? Is the difference between being mind a mindful state of mind and an unmindful state of mind meaningless? Focus more on the quality of your mind. Um, because when you start to see that the quality of your mind is pure, is uh, alert, is alive, is vibrant, nourished. We were talking this morning, the Buddha uses the word ojavanta. The, the Buddha sasana is ojavanta for a person who's practicing. Oja is uh, this n n nutrient. Uh, so that it's it's it nourishes the nourishment oja, the essence, and so you'll find yourself nourished and and vibrant and alive because of it. Your quality of the mind in that moment, and then you don't because yes, there are many reasons why you could be feeling calm, why you could be feeling peaceful, why you could be feeling kind and loving and become a good person. There's lots of factors. It's not really a great way to judge progress because there's so many potential factors. And in, in fact, the, the, the idea of judging progress is problematic. It's hard to judge your progress, at least over the short term. I think over the long term, you'll start to see some real changes if you pick up mindfulness. Uh, but the real difference, I guess, in the end between say, temporary concentration and seeing clearly is that seeing clearly leads to Nibbana. So once you experience Nibbana, then you can say, oh yeah, that was something beyond just temporary concentration. I don't know, even before that it becomes quite clear because seeing clearly is about seeing the three characteristics and you can't do that. That's nothing to do with just temporary concentration. Although it is a kind of temporary concentration. I mean, it is in fact... Mindfulness um, possesses a temporary concentration. So, but I don't think that's what you're referring to. You're referring to a more uh, stable but temporary, uh, you know, lasting concentration. And that's not what mindfulness is about. But the difference there is you'll start to see impermanent suffering and non self through mindfulness. You won't see that through just concentration. I cannot sit because of back problems. Can I continue my noting practice while lying and walking and still get the same results? Of course, there's nothing magical about sitting. Now, sitting is a good posture, so most likely the answer is no, but um, if your back problems are simply back pain, then you might consider trying to sit sometimes. I mean, I assume by back problems you mean some injury that is actually literally preventing you. But if it's just pain, sometimes you might want to try to sit up. Don't be too quick to uh, discard it. That's all I, all I would say, and it completely depends on your situation. But I assume that in your case you're talking about something more serious, like an actual uh, severed, you know, broken back or something, you know, or something maybe not quite so severe, but something pretty bad that would cause injury if you were to try to sit up. Absolutely, lying, walking, it's all great. There's four postures, walking, standing, sitting, and lying, and all four are usable. And in fact, even if there's some posture that isn't categorized as any of those four, it's still fine. Does do not kill apply to plant life? Would it be wrong to kill an insect by removing it from a houseplant it was relying on? Well, those are two very different questions, right? It's do not kill. Um, there's no do not kill in Buddhism. This isn't, a, this isn't a commandment. There's no God telling you not to kill. It's a precept that people take up as a practice. It's a very powerful practice when you commit to not killing. But as Buddhists, we don't generally commit to not killing plant life. Monks do. Monks, in fact, do commit to not killing plant life. Um, but it's not considered unethical, generally speaking. As far as removing an insect from a house plant, um, I mean, it, it's a bit cruel if it does rely on the plant for life somehow. 
but it's not killing it's not directly that that's a bit of a technicality though because if it is if you are sure that it's going to die when it's removed from the house plant then then it is a bit cruel it's probably not very wholesome if someone acts rudely and you start thinking about them negatively is it ever advisable to introduce countering thoughts for example pitying them or giving benefit of doubt or should we just be mindful um so it, yes it can be useful as sort of a stopgap measure it's much better if you're able to be mindful and overcome your negative emotions your disliking or whatever um, sometimes it's good just to walk away but there are ways of of uh, countering it with something else the usual problem with that is it doesn't cut through to the conceit and and ar arrogance the delusion aspect of the mind so usually how it comes across is as patronizing or or condescending like if someone acts rudely and you smile and try your best to be kind um the, the danger is that you get into because you're it's controlling you're 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 actively trying to cultivate something and that's self there's self involved there so you run into issues of ego i am kind and and so on i mean it's just not as clear in the mind as being mindful so it's never going to be as fruitful or as pure if if done correctly it can be pure but it's still just a covering up it's not really a long term solution so again as a stopgap measure it can be useful um yeah just like it can be useful to leave the room for example remove yourself from the situation even though that's not the solution it helps put you in a place where you can be more mindful I keep falling back on my bad habits. Do you have any advice? Well, don't be too discouraged because that reality is is a part of of non-self. I mean, it's a part of reality that you aren't in control of your bad habits. So even just seeing that is often a good result of of being more mindful. Now, I don't know if you are being mindful or if you're meditating, but if you are if you are practicing I mean, if you aren't, I can suggest considering starting to practice mindfulness and maybe read my booklet and do our at-home course. Um, but if you are doing that and you're still seeing yourself falling back on bad habits, that's just an important part of the practice, seeing how you're not in control. It helps you learn to see the unwieldiness of your habits, helps you see the disadvantages of cultivating them. And so over the short term, it may be frustrating when you're not able to overcome them. But over the long term, that's a great shift when you start to to see the issues with your habits. And also just get a, um, a better perspective on them. So rather than getting frustrated when you're not in control, you start to see that that's just the nature. And so you become less frustrated. My advice would be to look at how frustrating it is or disappointing or sad or any kind of self-hatred you might have because you're falling back on your bad habits and try to overcome that, try to note that and let, let it go. Start to have a better perspective and realize that, yeah, it's just a truth of life that we're not in control of our habits. They get out of our control and the more we feed them, the more out of control they become. And when you decide they're wrong, you can't just turn them off. It's just... Um, just habit or uh, cultivation. So you have to you have to cultivate opposing mind states or different mind states, ones that weaken the habit or change the habit. My practice feels arbitrary. I sometimes ignore minor things and just keep noting whatever I'm on. Sometimes I note absolutely everything that arises. Somehow, both ways seem incorrect. Please advise. 
you know, we seem to be getting these questions again and again, whether you should ignore or whether, and it just seems overly obsessive. Um, I mean, what I'd really focus on is the fact that something seems some way. That's just a seeming, that's, that's a state of mind, the judgment of something being incorrect. I'm not sure what it would mean for something to be incorrect. What would that look like? If it feels like that, that's just a feeling. Feels arbitrary. That's just a feeling. That's. I mean, it's just a perception in the mind, and you should note that it's usually accompanied by doubt or confusion or worry, fear, those kinds of things, disliking, frustration. So, you're probably that's probably much more important for you to be mindful of than for you to figure out some theoretical correct way to be mindful. Is there any space in which you should reflect on certain thoughts arising, especially if they are repetitive, perhaps trying to show you something you are ignoring, or just keep on noting? I mean, technically, no, in terms of the actual practice, but in terms of your life, of course, there's room to reflect. And in terms of practical Buddhism, there's going to be room for reflecting. On things that are important, but you know, th just because they're repetitive doesn't doesn't lead doesn't mean that. Um, and the idea that something might be trying to show you something is is not possible. Thoughts do not try to show you something. There's a, the reason for them being persistent is is our attachment to them, uh, and just the fact of there being a part of habits that are out of our control. So. It's not about just keep on noting. The noting has helped you to see that your thoughts keep are repetitive and they keep coming back, and they're even kind of nonsensical in that way. There's no reason for them to keep coming back. Without meditation practice, you tend you get a sense that oh, these thoughts come back for a reason, or there's part of it. There's a method to it. Oh, that oh yeah, now I'm thinking about that. Well, that's important for me to think about. As you start to meditate, you see it's not quite like that. Our thoughts are are pretty random and, and chaotic and ob obsessive. And you'll see the, the same thought. It's like a neuron. It's, it is. It's neurons firing, like kind of um, involuntarily. You'll see your thoughts are really involuntary. You think the same thing again and again and again. And that's an important thing to start to see. It changes your perspective on your mind and on your brain and on your thoughts. You start to take them less seriously and you stop trying to look for meaning or or thinking of them as having importance or that sort of thing. They're, they are just thoughts. There is no importance in the ultimate sense. I feel like my antidepressive medication is in the way of going deeper in my meditation. What do you so think? I've never, sorry, I've never been on antidepressive anti depressants personally but i have taught people who are on them and i can say without much doubt that they absolutely do get in the way of it's not quite going deeper it's about really uh, confronting i guess it feels a bit like going not, not going deeper there's just not much you're not really confronting anything um, you're not challenged in the way that you should be challenged you're not um, changing your mind because you don't really have to change your mind it's um, it's too easy, and it's too far removed, and it's it's um, avoidant. Why are you taking antidepressants? And I'm not attacking you because I understand why people. But why are you taking them? Because you're unable to face the the depression, for example, or anxiety, or whatever the the medication might be for. So that's antithetical to what we're trying to do, which is to face. And I'm not trivializing it because I'm not meaning to trivialize it. I, I understand completely how overwhelming it can be. I appreciate that. Um, but there is no um, avoiding the ultimate um, necessity of facing the experiences. So for someone who's on antidepressant, anti-anxiety, anti-anything, you know, any kind of psychoactive medication, uh, I, I would encourage them to gain the perspective of rather than moving away from it in some ways trying to avoid it or or heal it just by not facing it or something think of think of yourself as uh, all you've done is retreat it and prepare yourself to have to go back 
and face the thing that made you take the antidepressants in the first place. In, in, in other words, eventually you have to get back to where you were before you were taking the antidepressants. You just all you need is the strength to 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 get there and to go through it. That the antidepressants are not the solution. That's my view on it. Now, I'm not saying stop taking your antidepressants, but you have to go back. You've retreated, and that's fine in the short term, but in the long term, it's not a solution. Eventually, you have to wean yourself off of them, hopefully with some tools, mindfulness being probably, well, most definitely the best tool that will help you be stronger and more able to face them. I mean, the, the biggest problem, I think, is is, you know, quite simply the fact that such tools as mindfulness are not recognized enough by the by people prescribing these medications that there's no uh, appreciation of the power of mindfulness now there certainly is and and i think all throughout western medicine there is an appreciation of mindfulness it's just the structures and the systems and the, that are set up and the or the the systems that provide you with those medications don't have an alternative and they don't believe in an alternative often so without mindfulness there really is nothing but to take medication i appreciate that without mindfulness i don't understand how you would ever overcome serious depression or anxiety fortunately i i feel you know completely reassured completely confident in telling you that mindfulness does provide you with the capacity to deal and to eventually overcome depression and anxiety. I'm afraid of public speaking. How do I get rid of the fear? Don't try to get rid of the fear. Try and, live and be mindful of the fear. Uh, something I went through, I had to go through learning how to public speak. I, I saw, you know, it was a very mo young monk, most monks didn't want to give talks in Thailand, where I was anyway. And they would often pass it off to anyone. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to be a monk, I mean, this has to be a part of what I do. And so I knew I wasn't going to be very good at it. And I just you know, said, I'm going to do it, even if I'm not very good. And oh, I was anxious. Uh, so I had to deal, I had to approach that. But using mindfulness from, with someone who has mindfulness as a tool, it becomes less scary. The fear becomes less of a of a, a boogeyman. It doesn't mean you're free from fear, but you acknowledge the fear. You 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 are cognizant and familiar with the fear, and you become more and more familiar with the fear. And that familiarity, of course, neutralizes it and removes it. You know, if you're no longer afraid of the fear, then you're no longer afraid. You know? So try and cultivate states of mind that are not afraid even of the fear. Try and note uh, especially the physical sensations that are triggered by the fear, like tension and and heart beating and that sort of thing, because that's not fear, but that can trigger more fear and anxiety. Stop, stop thinking of yourself as getting rid of the fear. Learn to live with it, uh, to have a better relationship with it, because that relationship will free you from it, will, will remove it, will neutralize it. If you try to get rid of it, you're just going to get more afraid of it. You, you have more of an aversion to it, and you're just going to make it stronger. Is it correct that, if meditating devotedly and correctly, you will be protected by the law of karma, you will not be hungry or sick, no fear of being outdated, and your physical appearance would improve? I think much of that is not true. Uh, the law of karma doesn't... Hmm. I mean, it, there's half-truth here. If meditating, meditating devotedly and correctly, you would be protected by that practice, um, and by extension, the law of karma. But it's not quite what you're making it out to be. You certainly won't be uh, immune to the things that you're talking about. You'll be protected insofar as you're, you're practicing. The Buddha said the Dhamma protects you, not karma. Karma isn't something that protects you. Karma is something that ensures just desserts. 
So a person who is meditating correct, they will certainly get positive results. The only results that could come from that meditating correctly could be positive. That's sort of the law of karma. Um, but as far as not being hungry or sick, all I can say is that because of that meditation, I mean, that meditation will not be a cause for you to get hungry or sick, but will it stop you from getting hungry or sick? Absolutely not. It's not that mad. It's not magic like that. You couldn't stop eating just because you're mindful. You'll still get hungry. Um, it will help you with fear, but uh, it's not going to prevent you from feeling fear. It's just something that it will eventually free you from fear. I don't understand outdated. I, I'm, I think that's a mistype or something. Uh, your physical appearance? Yes, I think to some extent you'll be more radiant. I mean, it's not going to straighten your teeth or fix your eyesight or something like that. Uh, cure acne or something. But uh, but some things. I mean, you'll be more healthy in general just because the mind is more at peace. There's less stress in the body. So your physical appearance, you'll be more radiant and more uh, attractive and that sort of thing. <laughs> Attract is probably the wrong word. More, um, I mean, I, I, meant, I meant that not in a romantic sense. I mean, people will be attracted to you. They will see you as someone uh, worth talking to, worth knowing. They'll, they'll be more friendly. That's what I meant doesn't give you more sex appeal. I am six feet, five inches tall, and when people look at me, I get nervous sometimes. Any advice? Yeah, well, think of me walking around in the West in a monk's robe. I can appreciate standing out. Uh, I, mean, it, it, I think of people who are minorities, uh, black people living in 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 white neighborhoods. Imagine how they feel. Uh, even even being sorry, not talking about being a monk here, being a monk in Thailand because I'm the only white monk uh, standing out. I can appreciate standing out and uh, how it makes you nervous when people look at you. And and I just say this because I think it's something you can't avoid. Many of us end up being in these situations, or you know, some worse than others, of course. I don't have to fear for my life just because I'm wearing a monk's robe, not usually. But I do have sometimes to, uh, people shout at me in ways that they wouldn't shout at anyone else. Driving down the street, they'll, I'm walking down the street, they'll shout at me nasty things or whatever. Um, so I don't think, it's the sort of thing the Buddha said, uh, you have to be prepared for people's reaction to you be all sorts of things. Many of us have to go through this many times in our lives where we stand out and we have to put up with people looking. I mean, it's not such a big deal for someone who's mindful because who cares, right? What, what, what does it matter to me how people look at me? What does that even mean? You're just mindful of it. I get nervous sometimes, all I would say, you know, I mean, the real best advice I can give you is be mindful put aside the first part of your question because it doesn't matter why you get nervous that has no consequence and no effect on what you should do when you feel nervous you should be mindful of the nervousness no matter what it's caused by i studied music and i have musical instruments could i use them to inspire and encourage people for the benefit of others throwing everything away selling it seems a waste what would you recommend i'm probably not in the position that you are but i studied music and not seriously i'm sure not in the way that you would consider studying music i had musical instruments and i got rid of all of them and it was hard because uh it's quite an attachment i i, I would i would question whether it seems a waste that's what they call the sunk cost fallacy um, potentially. I mean, the only way it would be a waste is if there were something beneficial to it. And I don't think music is considered to be beneficial, could ever really be considered to be beneficial. It's just an addiction to pleasant, or not even necessarily pleasant, but triggering sounds. So they can trigger different various emotions, sadness, um, usually pleasure. And that's not considered to be a, a, a good thing. So, I mean, 
sometimes in life you have to throw away things that seem valuable. Uh, music, I threw away a lot of uh, intellect. I mean, I could have been a, a math major in university or any sort of major, and I threw that all away. Intellect is, uh, is one. Riches, people throw away riches. Um, the Buddhist practice really goes contrary to so much, and usually people who begin on the path find themselves at odds with their old path. And uh, it can be challenging because you you had a sense of of the effort you've put in to getting on that path and to just give it all up. Well, my parents certainly weren't happy with me giving everything up, I, wasting, you know, wasting my potential. And and of course, not the only one. Anyone who follows this path inevitably faces those sorts of criticisms. Your education is wasted, that sort of thing. And sometimes people, as I said, throw away all their money, give away all their money or something like that, or just give it away to charity. And it seems like a waste. Sometimes people quit their jobs, which seems like a waste. I'm not suggesting that you should do all those things, but I mean, music isn't really wholesome, unfortunately. It's not something I would consider to be a waste to throw away. And that says someone who's been there, you know, someone who had all that, had had on a limited, limited scale, that sort of thing. I had a $1,200 electric guitar that I sold, and it got me a plane ticket to Thailand. When I say thinking, thinking, when images pop in, it stops the thinking in its tracks. Is this correct? Should this happen? Or is this myself trying to stop thinking even though I'm not actually trying? Yeah, I mean, first of all, images which should be noted as seeing, seeing, that, just to correct you there. Um, but that's correct, yeah. Um, of course, the thinking will stop because your mind is now otherwise occupied. Of, of course, anything mental will stop when you start to be mindful because there's a new. So that's not the point. The, I mean, the the, the that's not a, an issue. Um, the the issue is that the thought is going to lead to something, and if you're not mindful, it usually leads to a reaction. So we're replacing that with a null reaction, a reaction that is non-reactive, a, to a tautological reaction, if you if you will, where you where seeing is just seeing. So there's it's a loop back, no no response. How can one remove addiction from one's life? Well, mindfulness is the best way I can think of. If you're interested, you can read our booklet on how to meditate. Uh, we have an at-home course that I encourage people to sign up. we got lots of free spaces. I think as it warms up and as people uh, are freed from the apparent restrictions of the pandemic, there uh, is less of a urgency for taking the course. But if you haven't taken our at-home course, I'd recommend considering it because we got lots of slots. It's free, and we're never going to charge you money for anything. So go ahead, check it out. It seems staggering how much we are harming other beings inadvertently. Is there a sutta about this? It seems more prominent than ever with COVID, microplastics, carbon footprint, etc. Any advice? I mean, you're not presenting a, a, a an issue for yourself that needs advice. I'm assuming this isn't, I'm not criticizing this question, but adding any advice seems like just looking for a question. Maybe, you, I mean, if any thoughts might be a better Maybe really what you're looking for, because I don't have any advice for you on these things that are not directly related to you, uh, except I guess I would say if you are harming other beings. 
So I, I guess, okay, so what, what, what we can look at it here as um, any advice on how I should approach uh, my carbon footprint and uh, how should I approach COVID and microplastics, you know, my use of these things or so on. Uh, but it's still, I would say, any thoughts is probably more and more what I how I can answer this. Uh, and as far as there being suttas about it, so of course there are no suttas about COVID or microplastics or carbon footprint. But I would say there are two general threads that relate to this, and uh, the first is in relation to sickness and the increase in sickness in the world. And the Buddha related that to our cruelty towards each other as living beings, how we're cruel to animals. So the slaughter of cows, the slaughter of, of farm animals, has undeniably, inarguably, led to an increase in sickness, right? If we were all vegetarian, for example, uh, there would be far less illness of all sorts in the world, you know, a lot less bacteria and bacterial infections. It's just incredibly... It's, uh, enhanced through our farming, uh, industrial farming methods, factory farming methods, and just this staggering level of cruelty and the perversion of it has, has obviously led to greater perversion for us. We're becoming more prone to sickness and a lot more bacteria and diseases. It just comes from the perverseness of our way of life. Uh, so the Buddha did talk about that. He He, he mentioned specifically that with the slaughtering of cows, there were like a hundred new diseases that arose. I mean, it's just the, the importance from a Buddhist perspective is the connection between our perversion of mind and the the results, the negative, stressful, suffering, unwholesome results for us. And uh, related is um, our environment, that actually there is Buddhist uh, theory on the degradation of the environment that it's again caused by the corruptions in our mind and over time we become more and more corrupt in our activities more and more greedy in modern speak we would say more and more consumerism right materialistic and as a result of that which which you know consumerism materialism these are just euphemisms for greed right with more and more greed more and more delusion even more and more anger can be attributed hatred of each other there's a, there's a pollution of the world where we have less and less consideration for others and more and more obsession with our own pleasure. Um, plastic, you know, was just, it, it just blew up. Everything became so much more convenient with plastic. And uh, we jumped on the train out of greed without any consideration of the disgusting nature of plastic and how it was not really necessary it just allowed us to have greater access to what we wanted to allowed us to cultivate more wanting on a greater scale that's all it really is and we're reaping the results our progress it's not really progress progress as a human species is not really progress we've just gotten more and more greedy more and more materialistic even technology a lot of our uh, the the solutions to our problems were just a byproduct of the problems themselves, like us needing to find new medicines for pandemics. I mean, from a Buddhist perspective, we wouldn't have needed them if we weren't so perverse and and hadn't corrupted our minds systematically, generation after generation, to the point where we have these sicknesses cropping up. Anyway. It's a little bit philosophical or religious. I mean, I don't suppose that I have any hard data to back it up, but that's the general sense of how things go. We, we enter into greater uh, degradation of the environment through the corruption of our minds. So the solution is just to free ourselves from greed, to wake up. And if, if and when that, ever, that trend ever takes place where people start to change and, and become more... Um, content and less greedy, then we'll see the environment improve. I think we've crossed the hour. 
There's one question left in the top tier. Do you have time to okay. answer? Yep. How can I remove my suicidal thoughts and concentrate on the present? So for suicide, you really should contact a professional. Um, I'm, I'm obligated to tell you that this is not a place to uh, receive advice on suicide. Um, I would say that thoughts are not consequential or meaningful, and anyone can have a thought about killing themselves without actually being suicidal. So since you haven't said that you are suicidal, um, I would say about thoughts is, again, just like fear, we're not trying to remove them. There is no consequence to having a thought about killing yourself, about killing someone else, about doing any number of perverted things. Like if you start telling yourself, you 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 get worried about having some perverse thought, and you tell yourself, "Don't think that, don't think that." That's not how it works. It usually works the opposite, of course. That you you the more you worry about it, the more power you give it, and uh, the worse it becomes when it does arise. Thoughts are not an issue. A thought is just a thought. Because just because you're having suicidal thoughts doesn't mean you are suicidal. And that's a mistake people make. You, you give them power. You think because you're thinking these thoughts, they must mean something, and you don't want to think them, which of course feeds the loop and, and feeds the thoughts and triggers them again and triggers your, your reactions again until you start believing it, that you are maybe uh, suicidal, for example. So I would recommend, if you're interested, to read our booklet and maybe do the at-home course. And you should find that you can have a better sense of your thoughts. But if you are suicidal and you're really uh, sincerely thinking about killing yourself, then there are many, many resources in most places of the world to help you deal with those and uh, connect you with professionals. I'm not a qualified, certified professional to help you deal with that. And I could get in trouble if I tried to present myself as one. So I hope I've covered my bases on that. I wish you all the best and hope you find peace. Thank you, Bhante. That's all the questions we have prepared for today. Thank you for your help. And, uh, thank you. Do we have Jim and Rahid? Yes. And thank you all for coming out. Have a good day and a good week. Sadhu. Sadhu.